Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I am not joined by Taylor Rockwell today, or at least not right now. He will be joining me later to watch some Champions League. Today's guest is the one and only Grant Wall. If you're a soccer fan in America, you don't need me to tell you who Grant Wall is. He's a senior writer at Sports Illustrated and an at-large correspondent for Fox Sports. And he's just published a new book. The book is called Masters of Modern Soccer. And here's the concept. Wall sat down with players and coaches and a sporting director and had them explain how they do what they do, how their positions work. The interviewees are, wait for it, Christian Pulisic, Javier Hernandez, Vincent Company, Xabi Alonso, Manuel Neuer, Roberto Martinez and Michael Zork. And unofficially, Juan Carlos Osorio. I've read the book and really enjoyed it, got a lot out of it. And I also enjoyed speaking to Grant about the process of writing, Masters of Modern Soccer, and what he learned in doing so. So I am joined from the Sports Illustrated offices, I'm told, uh, by Grant Wall. Grant, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. You are welcome. First time on the show, right? When we, We've spoken once before in January, but I don't think we've ever had a long, long conversation. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to this. Yeah, no, it was great meeting you guys in uh, in January and fired up for this. All right. So um, this is an odd question to start with, but can you describe the Sports Illustrated office to me? <laughs> I, like, I like to know, it's, like, you know, where when I'm talking to someone, I like to know sort of where they are and what they're doing. Well, it's probably less exciting of a place than some people might imagine. Uh, we're on the seventh floor of a building in downtown Manhattan, right across from the World Trade Center at 225 Liberty Street. Uh, I am currently in the SI Podcast Studio, Aha. which, uh, once again, sounds cooler than it probably is. It's basically a converted office, uh, but it does have some nice uh, f- uh, pictures of athletes on the walls here that say SI Podcast. So we've got LeBron James, uh, we've got uh, Tiger Woods, and we have Clint Dempsey hey. uh, representing soccer. All right. Well, I'm in the TSS podcast studio where the, the view out the window is not quite as inspiring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're here to talk about your new book, Masters of Modern Soccer, which I believe publishes uh, or is on sale in May 1st. Is that correct? May 1st is the day. Okay. So my, my first question is um, more of a professional question. Than, so I have read the book, so I've got some very detailed questions about the book for you. But I'm okay. genuinely interested in someone like yourself who's what you're on staff at Sports Illustrated and you do some work for Fox Sports as well. Right. How do you persuade those two employers to give you the time to go and write a book like this? Because my understanding from reading the book is that you spent a lot of time doing many, many hours of interviews. So basically, how do you get the time off? Yeah, so I've written two books. It's been a whole nine years since my first book came out, so it's been a while. But um, it's a situation where a lot of planning went into this second book. And, um, you know, I've got different employers. My main job is uh, at Sports Illustrated. My second job is with Fox Sports. Uh, I signed a two-book deal with the publisher Crown way back in 2007, and I appreciate their patience for my second book. (laughs) And, you know, there's so much in modern media, uh, so many different platforms that you do stuff for. You know, when I started out, I was just writing for the magazine. Uh, We didn't really even have a website, but obviously I write for magazine, website. I do my own podcasts. Uh, I do TV. I have a video show at SI, two podcast episodes a week, all that stuff. And so for both of my books, I have taken a leave of absence for uh, three months for my first book and four months for this book, which turned out to be three and a half, um, just for the writing part. So uh, for me, I need that time. I can't write a book on the side of a full-time job. I know some people can. I can't. And I'm much better off having that be the only thing I do for a three and a half, four month period of time. So does that mean that you squeezed in the actual interview and research parts while you were still doing your other jobs? Correct. So Uh that's the part that you have to get creative in terms of uh, how you find time to report and do the interviews for a book on the side of a full-time job. And that's just not easy, you know, Um, but I was able to do it. Um, 
it helped a little bit that the interviews for this book started out as a Sports Illustrated magazine story um, that I did back in 2016 with uh, four of the players that appear in this book. And that was basically one interview with each guy. And uh, that was a really rewarding process. And it uh, then was possible to use that to launch into more interviews with more figures for the seven figures that are in this book. And so uh, what I'll tend to do is when I go to Europe and all the figures in my book are from European soccer, uh, I I would do some Sports Illustrated interviews. Uh, I would do some book interviews. And I try to do uh, multiple things to make the most of a Europe trip. So um, looking at the book, I, I when I first saw the, the idea, um, I sort of got the wrong idea. And I assumed it was just sort of seven magazine profiles of famous players, right? Like Pulisic, <laughs> Chicharito, Vincent Company. And I kind of thought like... Oh, that's a weak idea for a book. That's just seven magazine stories mashed together. Um, but obviously, upon reading it, um, now I have a much better understanding uh, of what the book is all about. It, it really is like for someone like me, who I, I think of myself as kind of a, a soccer nerd. Like I love hearing the little, the little details um, of um, you know like how Vincent Company wins headers. You know what I'm saying? I've never yeah. sort of seen that described before. So that stuff is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, so then my question becomes, what? when did you decide that that's the type of thing you wanted to do to get into these sort of weird little details for this book? Well, there's a famous uh, classic baseball book from the early 1990s by the political writer George Will called Men at Work, The Craft of Baseball. And uh, this is essentially the idea of, that he took of breaking down the sport of baseball into four component functions. For him, it was a batter, a pitcher, a fielder, and a manager, picking one person to represent each function who is really good at, th- at their job but also really intelligent at explaining how they did it, uh, and then spending a lot of time interviewing them about that. And you could do that with any sport, and so... You know, no one really has for for other sports, and so that's what my goal was to do with this book for soccer. So, would, and, would you say there's no equivalent soccer book? Because I, I mean, I can't think of one, but I wondered if there was a sort of a soccer book model that you sort of could lean on as well. Not really, you know, and, and that's kind of what you're looking for at the start. You don't want to write the same idea that someone else did, yeah. and. It's amazing to me, this is the game itself, you know, and we don't often talk about in the media when we do interviews with players about the finest points of how they play their position on the field. It's kind of crazy that we don't do that more often, but typically when we do interviews, we have a limited amount of time in a post-game setting and you're you're talking about the game or you're doing a sit down interview for a magazine story in my case and you're talking more about storytelling uh things that are happening outside the field of play like this person has an interesting life story and here we go and it was just a situation where i stepped outside of my comfort zone a little bit because i've always been more about storytelling and that's more of what my first book was about and less about the really fine points of what happens on the field and how smart people who are really accomplished approach what they do and watching video with them and spending hours with them and just asking them what's going on in your mind when you are seeing this you on the field. Yes, yeah, so it's essentially you got um, a masterclass in how to, you know, how to defend, how to play midfield, how to attack um, with the video element you described. I'm sort of describing this for people who haven't read the book. You know, the, the players really were sitting you down, watching footage of themselves and explaining um, how they do it. Um, and I, I kind of wonder, has this changed the way that you will watch soccer going forward? Like, is there new information that you like a new way of looking at the game that will um, that will change it for you now that you've you know learned how to um, dribble through Christian Pulisic's eyes? Um, <laughs> I does mean, it, does for it change me, yeah. it for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, I picked the right guys for this book, and there, a lot went into that. Um, but I was really happy with just how insightful each one of the figures in this book 
was. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not even in their first language. But to spend time with a Shabby Alonzo or Manuel Neuer or Vincent Company, um, all of these guys uh, just basically gave me an education in how much they think about the game. And what's going on in their head, all the decision-making process, all the things that they're trying to anticipate in a particular moment during a game. And you realize how much these guys think the game, that it's not just some, you know, physical thing. You can't play soccer at a world-class level without thinking it on uh, just uh, – you know, in every minute of a 90 minute game. And these guys don't switch off. Now, certainly there are players who do. Certainly there are players out there who aren't very good at verbalizing what they do. I would guess 95% of players aren't very good at that. But, you know, these guys were picked for a very specific reason. And once I heard all the things they were saying, I was fascinated. I kept asking questions, and I just wanted to make sure I got it on the page, the best stuff that they were sharing with me. How did you know that these guys would be the right guys? I mean, could, could there have been a situation where maybe the, the second session with, say, Chubby Alonso, you could suddenly realize, oh, no, he's not going to be able to tell me how he does this? Well, I had had some interactions with Chubby Alonso before this book, and he was just an amazing interview, so thoughtful so willing to share kind of his secrets, you know, how he approaches a game, tricks of the trade. Yeah. Um, and so in making the list of the guys I wanted to pursue for this book, he was always at the top of the list for a defensive midfielder, and thankfully he was willing to participate. There were other examples of people I had interviewed before. Christian Pulisic is one that I thought he could be an insightful figure despite being a teenager and having much less experience than company or Alonzo or Neuer. And I think Pulisic holds his own in the chapter with Alonzo on the attacking midfielder position. And I don't think Pulisic in any other place has, has shown his, I mean, this level of understanding of the game. For anyone yeah. who's followed Pulisic's career, I think it's a really instructive thing to, to listen to how he approaches the game. Um, there were other guys like Vincent Company that I had not interviewed before, and that's where I would contact my friends in the European soccer media and say, you know, I saw Vincent Company in this interview setting, and he sounded like an amazing interview, a really thoughtful guy in, in many ways, and about the game itself. Is that an accurate perception? The answer was yes. So let's try and get Vincent Company as the defender. And so that's kind of how the process went. And I just I can't say how thankful I am that these guys were willing to to spend their time with me to educate someone like me who I didn't play the game at a really high level at all. I, I haven't coached the game. And so I came at it with questions that probably included some stupid questions from time to time. And, <laughs> and they put up with me. So do you think it will change the way you sort of report going forward? Like, will there be sort of a, maybe a more and say say the three things that you write after a lot of big games? Can you imagine there being a sort of even more analytical angle now that you have had Juan Carlos Osorio explain synchronization to you? A little bit. I, I, I certainly have a, a deeper, more detailed understanding of how figures in the sport, players and managers, and even sporting directors, how they approach their jobs ahead of time. Yeah, and I think. So much in the media, we analyze things in a Monday morning quarterback type of situation after the fact. And I think one of the lessons I take from all of this is I'm paying more attention than ever to the process that goes into a game ahead of time and, and what someone, whether it's a manager or a player, is wanting to achieve in that game as opposed to simply from a a perspective of after the fact. So one of the things I was really interested in was um, Juan Carlos Osorio is not listed as being one of the subjects of the book. And I'm going to assume that it's because Roberto Martinez was the, the coach that was listed. And Osorio just kind of also happened to be there when you interviewed Chicharito about Chicharito's role with the Mexican national team. Um, but Osorio's details explanation of the, what, what he calls the synchronization, the sort of movements that he has his team performed to open space for guys like Chicharito and 
the, he put he tells you the reasoning, the rationale behind his squad rotation, which he's heavily criticised for. And Chicharito describes the sort of feeling on the Mexican team about how much they trust Osorio. It made me want Osorio to be the next US men's national team head coach. Um, and I wondered if you had the same experience um, after sort of having this, spending this time with him. Yes, to answer your question. Um, and it's interesting to me, not just Osorio, but Roberto Martinez. I think both those guys would be good candidates to coach the U.S. men's national team. And I think there might be interest. And mm. uh, we'll obviously see what happens at the World Cup. But, um, you know, both have connections to the U.S., both have a, a lot of experience in Europe. Um, you know, they, they certainly bring different things to the table. I wasn't planning for Juan Carlos Osorio to become sort of an unofficial character in the book, but... I ended up spending so much time over a two-day period with Osorio and Chicharito and the Mexican national team when they were in Denver last uh, May that it was sort of impossible not to include a lot of details from Osorio. And this basically unheard of situation where I got for more than an hour, it was just me and Chicharito and Osorio talking about these uh, systematic patterns that the Mexican national team sets up to try and get Chicharito the ball in front of the goal. Um, and Chicharito spent time explaining in detail what every Mexican player was supposed to be doing. We literally sat above a table with, uh, you know, 11 tabs, circular tabs that uh, for each team that Osorio puts out, he carries with him everywhere he goes. And at the end of Chicharito explaining all of it, Osorio himself was really almost dumbfounded, but uh, impressed that Chicharito could verbalize exactly what he was trying to do with the entire Mexico team. Yeah, wasn't the, the line is something like, I did not know, I did not know he knew so much. Yeah. I, and what's <laughs> cool is, too, is that there's actually uh, going to be on the Sports Illustrated site uh, an excerpt from this where I shot a cell phone video of this interaction where they were showing me this stuff with Chicharito and Osorio in English. And... Like, it, you don't get too many occasions where you get that much time with guys of that stature who uh, just don't do interviews like that very often. And it's it's pure soccer. Like, there's no discussion of stuff off the field. And I, I was just fascinated by it. I, I hope readers are interested, too. So do you... Did you get the impression that all these guys were willing to open up to you about this stuff? You know, you said about Alonso spilling his secrets kind of because it was a book and because I remember because there's a moment where Osorio talks about he asks you, when will this be published? Because I think he doesn't want some of these things getting out during World Cup qualifying is the impression um, I got. Right. Because these were going to these these synchronizations were going to be weaponized against Honduras, essentially. Um, do yeah, you, I mean, li there, there was literally a, a game against the U.S. The qualifier at the Azteca was like a few days later. And I just think he didn't want that to come out publicly before that or right. even any time thereafter in qualifier. So he made me promise that this information, these details of their sort of set plays didn't come out until May of 2018. But do, so the question I was getting to is, do you think people, th these guys only gave you this access because it was a book with a sort of publication date in the future? Or do you think that sort of soccer journalism in America and around the world could take this more sort of analytical bent if people were sort of brave enough to ask the questions, to ask the right questions, instead of tell me how you feel about winning the game, if someone was willing to ask the, you know, the more detailed questions? I think there were a lot of factors that went into it for each person I talked to. Um, you know, uh, I, I I definitely was told by Osorio and Chicharito that they really enjoyed that this was purely about the sport itself and the finer points of the game as opposed to questions about that they often get in the media about who Chicharito is dating. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or tabloid type stuff. Um, I do think getting in the door at Man City to talk to Vincent Company or at Bayern Munich to talk to Xabi Alonso and Manuel Neuer. You know, I have relationships at those clubs from previous stories I've done, and I think that helped. And the fact that um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and and uh, have gotten to know some of the gatekeepers and, and, and also because, like, a lot of these top European clubs and figures want to be bigger in the U.S. And... Uh -huh. 
what I found over the years is they're sometimes willing to give U.S. media more access than they give to their own media over there. I see. That, yeah, that, actually, that makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, I want to ask you um, about the most interesting thing you learned apart from Roberto Martinez and Mrs. Martinez TV viewing setup. <laughs> Should I explain that now? Or yeah, I mean, first? Yeah, so I also I wasn't clear on like how much of the book you were comfortable giving away in interviews, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm happy I'm to li- I'm happy to leave that as a teaser, but I'd also love if you're willing to explain it. Yeah, I mean, basically, Roberto Martinez spends so much time on the job that when he's at home, he and his wife would always find themselves being in different rooms uh, where he was watching soccer and she was watching a soap opera that he came up with the idea to have an L-shaped couch in their living room and they have two TVs in their living room and they sit near each other. So they're physically together, but she'll be able to watch her show and he's able to watch soccer with his headphones on and that's how they spend, I guess, quality time together. <laughs> that's a that's a tactical marital innovation. <laughs> exactly. Um, but in in terms of surprises um you know it's i don't know if i was ever sort of blown away by uh anything surprising except just to you know how much detail that some of these guys would go into and how much they remember so with christian polisic i visited his uh apartment in dortmund and had put together this uh, clip reel, the video clips of him playing for the U.S. national team, of him playing for Dortmund, doing a lot of different things on the field. And Wait, sorry, you, you put that together yourself? Oh, no. No, I'm certainly not talented enough to do that. I had a friend here at Sports Illustrated on the video side do I that. I see, I see. Uh, and what became clear while talking to Polisic in detail about each one of these clips was that even though they were not in any chronological order, he within a a split second of switching to the new clip could tell me everything about what game it was, what he remembered the moment he remembered what he was thinking. And finally I, I paused it and I was like, you know, Christian, like, do you have like a photographic memory or something? And he was like, I remember everything. Like I, I just remember from a game from a year and a half ago and can recall it basically instantly. And it's the kind of thing, I don't know if that's all that common, but I think it's more common than we might realize. And it's the only kind, that topic only would have come up if we had had the time like we did to watch a bunch of video together. Um, So I don't know. I mean, like, we'll see if he's doing that when he's 28 years old, but like, (laughs) it's something where each moment on the field is something that goes into his sort of memory hard drive in his mind and and then contributes to how he learns from those moments and tries to get better moving forward. Yeah, and then as, reading that as a US fan really made me optimistic that this Christian Pulisic, this is a player that will continue to improve. If he's constantly remembering and thinking about like what to do differently or what to do next time, then that could only lead to more and more improvement um, as, as he matures. Clearly, he's studying the game. He's studying yeah. his his games. He's studying other people's games. Uh, it was interesting just to talk to Polisic and other players about how much soccer they watch and what they're looking for when they watch a game. And it's a little different, I think, from how I typically would watch things. You know, they're much more concerned with off the ball stuff. Mm-hmm. And Alonzo, Jabi Alonzo was like, I really prefer to watch a game from the tactical cam perspective, the sort of overhead uh, vertical view that gives you a whole idea of the field and where everybody is, as opposed to, I can imagine like Jabi Alonzo watching a game at home and, you know, these close ups during the run of play come on the TV. And I can imagine him grimacing while watching that. <laughs> oh, with that in mind, do you know if Fox Sports will be giving us a tactical cam for the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> that is above my pay grade, my man. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's taught me how to look at the game just talking to these guys uh, in a slightly different way. So here's a related question. Um, 
who is this book aimed at? Because I think this has some very specific, like I said, nerdy details in there that got me super excited. But then there are also some very sort of basic explanations of how a transfer works, and right. which seem to be aimed at maybe like soccer newbies. And I couldn't tell, is this, sort of, is this like, who is, who is this aimed at? Is this aimed at newbies, but to give them a different angle? Or is it aimed at the, the readers who you know, are already very familiar with soccer? Now, I'm going to guess your answer is going to be both. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing over the last 22 years at Sports Illustrated, whenever I write a magazine story on soccer, is keeping that in mind to try and write a story that will be interesting to a wide variety of audiences. And that includes the hardcore soccer fan, but it also includes the sports fan who may watch the World Cup, but not a lot else. Yeah. Uh, and that's a balance and you to strike that balance i think it's achievable but it's not always easy and so my intended audience for this book is the hardcore soccer fan um the people who watch daily weekly um and and yet at the same time also uh somebody who may get into the world cup and want to learn more about the sport uh someone who uh, might be coaching their kid's team, um, you know, a like I, I think you need to have some interest in soccer. So I'm not going to like try and get you interested if you have no interest in the sport. But I do think it's possible to to find a way for this to to reach different audiences and to not be like a dry textbook. And that was one of the concerns I had. I didn't want to just be like a a manual with like instructions on how to play the sport you know there's there's that's out there one, and i don't think this is that one of the things i think that you've done really well with the book is um it does have that sort of you know like magazine-y profile human element to it and then like from there i feel like i got to know the characters as they were explaining how they do certain things and i think that's what stops it being so textbooky if that makes sense yeah no I, that was part of the idea is to get give people a sense early on a chapter, maybe what these, you know, personality wise, what it's like to be in the video room at Man City with Vincent Company and a little bit on who this guy is. But it's still a departure for me. I mean, like, it's, you know, it's still more pure soccer and the interesting things that came up in these very specific interviews than it is about telling Vincent Company's life story. Uh, one one final question I have for you. Uh, so obviously Pulisic was, I mean, he's the big name in US soccer and he's this intelligent guy that is going to be great at sort of describing how and why he does things. Um, if you hadn't been able to get Christian Pulisic, what other American player do you think would have been a good interview for this type of book? It's a good question. Um, you know, my publisher wanted an American and I wanted an American and it worked out great that Pulisic was willing to do this because he's been the closest thing to an American men's world-class soccer player for a couple of years now. Um, I look at other players, uh, other U S players. And I, and I, what's interesting to me is, is the ones I think of who would have been good for this are former players like Claudio Reyna, I think would have been uh, a really good, smart person to include really intelligent insightful about the game tab ramos sticks out to me as somebody who might have worked in that regard um you know like a landon donovan who i guess is a current player um and you know that sort of thing um and yet Polisic's one of the few top americans playing at a high level in europe right now and in i think it's not a coincidence that all the figures in this book are involved at the highest level of the game in European soccer. So maybe that's a way of saying that I'm really glad Christian Pulisic said yes. <laughs> all right, fi final question, Grant, because um, I don't want to keep you on the phone for, for too long. What are your World Cup plans? I will be in Russia for the first time. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, obviously, it would be great if the U.S. had made it, but they didn't. Yeah, uh, that's the I reality we all have to live with, right? Yeah, I got to accept it. But I, I still am tremendously excited for the World Cup and working for Fox. Uh, they're building an insane set in Red Square for Fox Sports. Uh, and so that's where I'm going to be in Moscow uh, on the Fox Sports Studio show. I'm going to be uh, writing for Sports Illustrated. 
and also doing a po- daily podcast for Sports Illustrated. But this will be a different type of World Cup for me because usually I'm following the U.S. team. I'm embedded. I'm traveling around the country, and I may not travel at all inside uh, Russia, which I'm actually not disappointed by. The more you travel at a World Cup, the fewer games you see and the less good work you can do. Right. So so I'm looking forward to it. So w- one of the things we've been thinking on our show is that obviously the U.S. not being there is, you know, terrible for us but <laughs> yeah. i mean just in terms of how many people will be interested but and also you know the enjoyment of watching the u.s team but it does present this opportunity to to focus elsewhere and to give the games you maybe wouldn't have given as much attention can now get more attention because there's not sort of 50 percent of your attention is on the united states national team no i, I agree with that you know I, mean, I just spent a week in iceland and i'm you know uh, fascinated by what Iceland has done as the smallest population country ever to qualify for a World Cup. And I think they could actually stick around this World Cup for a while if things break the right way. So uh, there's so many other great stories that the World Cup always throws at everyone. And I think those stories are going to get a little more attention now uh, without the U.S. team involved. So I'm going to ask you an annoying question. And I know it's an annoying question for someone who's about to publish a book. Are there any plans for a third book? <laughs> it's actually not an annoying question. I, I'm looking forward to the next book. I'm not sure what it's going to be. My guess is now that I've figured out just how to manage my time with Sports Illustrated and TV commitments that uh, I'll probably – my hope is to write one book every four years and that I would write that book uh, and take a leave the summer before a men's World Cup year because that's sort of the one – slow summer tournament wise in the four-year cycle Um, and then it publishes just before the actual world cup which i'm assuming is the best time to publish a soccer book correct uh Uh, or or potentially if it's um you know before a women's world cup Mm -hmm. uh i'm certainly i've covered women's soccer for two decades and i'm that's certainly in my consideration for what my next book would be because I find what's happening in women's soccer, both domestically and globally to be really interesting right now. There you go. So we, we, we can, we can nail it down that you're definitely going to write your next book will be about women's soccer. <laughs> Don't hold me to it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, Grant, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. <laughs> 